Welcome to Surgeon's Log 2020, Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond, a webinar presented by the North American Skull Base Society in association with Global Brain Surgery Initiative. I'm your host, Dr. Walter Jean of George Washington University. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. For now, put on your learning hats and enjoy this episode of Surgeon's Log 2020. Good morning, everybody in the U.S. And uh, for our international audiences, this is a great time frame for you all. It's midday in Europe and uh, evening in Asia. Uh, So welcome, everybody, to the eighth episode of Surgeon's Log 2020. For this episode, we have a great panel. Uh, The presenting surgeon will be Michael Ivan from the University of Miami. And uh, our very special guest, senior surgeon, is Professor Atul Goyal from Mumbai, uh, professor and head at the King Edward Memorial Hospital. Uh, Dr. Goyal has a title, uh, have titles that are beyond uh, an hour to, to list them all. Uh, he is, suffice it to say, a past president of the Indian Neurosurgical Society, and he is on multiple editorial boards, including, uh, I believe, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a distinct pleasure to have uh, such a distinguished uh, international professor with us today. Um, Today's episode, Double Up, Double Down, our hot seat resident is Lakaj Dagubadi from Penn State. Without further ado, let's get started. So, Dr. Dagubadi, this is a 46-year-old man uh, who shows up to you with two months of blurry vision and vision loss in the left eye. Uh, He has uh, double vision whenever he tries to accommodate. The diplopia was, uh, uh, again, found on exam, confirmed on exam, and you seem to see a field cut uh, in the left eye on your uh, confrontation exam as well, Um, and uh, the field cut's uh, uh, inferior. Otherwise, uh, neurologically, he's intact, uh, which is to say that he's able to uh, move the eye, sensation with the face, and, and everything else is all right. Okay, so... First things first, um, first thing we do with neuro- neurological disease is always to find, f- figure out where and then what. So where? Absolutely. Um, based on the symptoms uh, localized to the left side and seems to be mainly of the vision, I'd be thinking uh, more in uh, the anterior middle fossa area and localized to the left side as opposed to a global um, pathology uh, because there's lack of right side of any issues with the right side. Can you be um, a little bit be, more specific as the po- regarding the anterior middle fossa? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I was thinking uh, more uh, in the orbital apex, uh, right around the um, cranial nerve two, because of a lack of uh, extraocular muscle um, pathology or uh, issues with the extraocular muscles, uh, be less concerned uh, with um, uh, less concerned with uh, uh, the cavernous sinus uh, at this point. Now, no, would you be he, able to... ha- he has diplopia though. He does have diplopia, uh, sorry. I, uh, what kind of diplopia does he have? Uh, Mike, can you specify a little bit for him? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was uh, diplopia with accommodation and, and also uh, with looking down. So more of like a third nerve kind of diplopia. Absolutely. Um, so based on that, I am thinking the superior orbital fissure region uh, on the left side. Okay. So what do you want to do next? Uh, ideally, uh, how long, ha- uh, if this is a chronic situation, I would go ahead and get an MRI with contrast uh, at this point. Okay. Uh, so just to describe the I- image in a little. Please do. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, axial MRI with contrast. Uh, shows to have a hyperdense uh, lesion uh, involving the uh, left uh, cavernous sinus uh, invading into uh, the uh, mesial uh, or, or putting pressure on the mesial temporal lobe as well as uh, downwards into uh, the uh, left-sided uh, prepontines uh, CP angle region going all the way down to uh, the seven, eight complex. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, dense may be the, the the wrong word here for that. That's more a CT term. This, this is we, we only know we only know that it's uh, uh, an enhancing. Uh, well, yeah. we don't know that it's enhancing because you don't have the pre uh, GAD, but it is enhancing. Uh, and uh, here are your coronals, and I'm going to give you the sagittals just to save time. Uh, there you have the uh, uh, sagittals as well. So uh, as opposed to last week when we also had a cavernous sinus tumor. Uh, and, th and that one was really a truly diagnostic uh, problem. This one, I think it might be easier. What is it? Um, based on location and the hyperintense, homogenous hyperintense, I would say meningioma. Okay. It's the most likely diagnosis. What's next? Uh, so would you be able to go back to the uh, okay. imaging real quickly? Uh, based on uh, the symptomology as well as uh, the rapid loss, uh, the uh, loss of vision, I'd want to... Um, I would want to do um, surgical intervention to decompress the optic nerve as well. Before, well. We, do, before we get there, what, what kind of an, uh, other evaluations would you like? I would want an uh, ophthalmological evaluation uh, to uh, formalize uh, the deficits the patient has. Uh, so we could also discuss uh, with them about the risks and benefits and the likelihood of any kind of a visual recovery. So for meningioma, there's, there are certain things that meningiomas do to surrounding things as well. Uh, are there any other evaluations you want since you said meningioma? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, in this circumstance, um, either from a preoperative planning, uh, I would want a CT stealth of the um, brain, especially the cavernous sinus, to see how it's invading. Uh, as well as I think a CTA would be helpful as well. The MRA showed that uh, the ICA on that side is uh, looked like it was patent on the MR um, eye with contrast. What what are you what are your thoughts on this CT? Um, could you go back up a little? Um, uh, well, I think okay. Hang on, I'm not sure that I can do that. I can replay it. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, so this is a, a CT stealth on the left side. It shows that uh, uh, there is mild hyperostosis. Uh, there's hyper, hyperostosis, uh, especially around the anterior clinoid, as well as uh, uh, hyperostosis uh, at the uh, anterior uh, temporal lobe, lobe there, the sphenoidal region. All right, so so that anterior thing, you, you you said the the key words, the magic words there. The anterior clinoid seems to be involved, and you're going to have to mm -hmm. figure something out with that. It might come into play with your for the decision further along. You said ophthalmology. Yes. It I think it just confirms what you uh, found on exam, which is that left eye is uh, problematic and it's an inferior mm -hmm. gut. Um, now, Dr. Ivan's going to give you something uh, else. Uh, well, the, the labs are unremarkable, by the way, and uh, he, he's going to give you this. Thoughts? Uh, why, do, why do you think he showed you this? Uh, not everybody would, would have gotten this, I don't think. I think it's important uh, because of the extent of this tumor going into the uh, CP angle. You want to figure out uh, how much uh, compression or invasion uh, there is of the 7A complex as well. All right. So what is the real problem for this guy? Uh, he has uh, invasive um, meningioma that's causing uh, compression of the optic nerve. Uh, All as right. So well magic, as... again, magic words there is a, is, a, is a vision problem, right? This is almost mm -hmm. like an ophthalmological problem. He, he's not really neurologically devastating. He's not having trouble walking. It's really the, the, the crux of the matter is and it's an ophthalmological uh, problem that, that plagues him. And um, what are you, when you look at this, when you start to think about the goals of treatment, what concerns you? What anatomical structures, compartments? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, based on the imaging, we know that uh, there's, and the symptomology, there's a fair amount of cavernous sinus invasion, uh, as well as the posterior fossa extension. Uh, but as you had mentioned, the primary focus should be um, the uh, slow loss of vision. So the goals of surgery for me would be um, a subtotal resection, with the primary focus on the superior fissure and the optic uh, canal 
uh, and try to decompress that by going and uh, removing the anterior climate process and the optic strut. All right, I'm, uh, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. 46 year old man, uh, you said your goal is uh, a partial, it's a partial resection for, with decompression of the optic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, devil's advocate, 46 year old man is gonna have a long life. What about radical cure? I think uh, um, we can go in, uh, based on the age, uh, it, it would be uh, reasonable to go into the cavern sinus and try to decompress it, but that could be an intraoperative decision based on the consistency of the tumor um, and uh, um, how much is uh, really coming out in terms of if you want to do upfront uh, radical resection versus um, adjuvant radiotherapy and go back in at a different time. So are you going to let your intraoperative findings guide you whether you go in or not to the cavernous sinus? Do you think the, 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 the nerves in the cavernous sinus are compressed or actually in, in, invaded by the tumor? I think um, they're, they're, is, uh, they're compressed as well. Uh, they're invaded by the tumor. I think the cavernous mm -hmm. sinus is invaded. I think that might be debatable. I think okay. to, to, if you choose to justify your partial resection and decompression concept, you, you, that, the, the, the line of thinking would be if you just simply decompress those nerves, they will mm -hmm. come back to function. Um, and uh, I think that most people would, would, would actually side with you and not mm -hmm. with a radical resection for cure. Uh, what would be, a, what, other than the nerves, what would be a major problem with that idea? Um, you'd be concerned about uh, invasion into the, uh, or compression of the ICA on that left side. Yeah, so uh, that, that might be an issue. Uh, what would you, so the, again, devil's advocate now, you say partial resection, decompression optic nerve. What about the residual? You, are you gonna, what are you gonna do with that? What if it grows back? I think if it grows back, it depends on um, where exactly uh, it grows back. Um, on that sagittal, I don't think there is a, a huge role for. Um, but do you have options if it does grow? You have uh, non-surgical options such as radiotherapy. Yeah, initially. so you have uh, you have fallbacks that could that could that could take care of it then, right? So again, that kind of helps you justify the decompression partial resection kind of idea. Uh, yeah, stick to your guns. Uh, so what is what is your goal of treatment? I think the goal of treatment at this point would be um, decompression of the uh, optic canal and if you could, um, superior, uh, the orbital apex. Uh, so the approach would be- Wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 we'll get there, we'll get there. But okay, so let's be clear, decompression of optic and uh, decompression of cavernous sinus, uh, uh, intended partial resection, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, now, choice, choices. What are your thoughts about um, those arrows? Uh, on the sagittal, uh, the arrows pointing out uh, the uh, posterior fossa extension and uh, uh, the uh, interaction it has with the uh, brainstem there, uh, the interface with the brainstem. And on the left side, I'm uh, oh, sorry, on the bottom image on the coronal, you could, you're pointing out the uh, internal carotid artery. Well, which you have already talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. if, your, if your goal of treatment is, is partial resection, intended partial resection, uh, are you going to do a BTO? I would, uh, I would like to have that information. Uh, so um, I, I would do a diagnostic angio and a BTO and possibly even look for, um, yeah, a BTO. Yeah, but okay, let's say he fails the BTO. Uh, you, you want to plan for a bypass? Up front, uh, I would be, um, well, I would not at this point. Right, I, I make, I'm making a point here, which is that th this is why we always set the goals first, right? Because mm -hmm. the goals determines what comes next. You, you don't, you don't mm -hmm. just think of what approaches first and then suddenly set the goal somewhere in the middle and amorphously just kind of pop up the goal of treatment. You have the goal of treatment being partial resection, decompression of the optic nerve, decompression of cavernous sinus. You really 
uh, uh, the the BTO doesn't come into play anymore, right? Because your your intention is not to sack the, the not radical resection sack the, the the ICA if it's a BTO positive. Um, the I think the the sagittal arrow I put there to, to to ask you, can one approach get to all this? Um, once again, it depends on the uh, goals of care. But uh, uh, if you uh, for chase if you're going after the posterior. Uh, um, Fossa area, uh, then you would need a potentially second approach to get that lower set, lower portion. So again, back um, to the goal of treatment, is that lower portion really part of your goal? At this point, no. All right, so you, you're thinking maybe that if, if you can't reach that down that low, it, it might be okay with the goal set as it is, right? Yes. Okay, so now comes the million dollar question. Approach of choice. Um, in this case, uh, I would, uh, focusing on the orbital apex, I would do a, a F FTOZ, um, an OZ uh, primarily, uh, to get down uh, to the orbital apex, as well as uh, gives you the option uh, to go uh, into the cavernous sinus and uh, decompress the cavernous sinus. Anything else other than the OZ? Think about, think about modifications of your OZ. Mm -hmm. What add-ons to the OZ? Do you, do you want to do more to get, make it easy to get to some portions that you may actually be able to get to? Uh, it's okay you, to say no. Um, I can't think of any right now. Okay. So, uh, if you've, uh, if anybody's read my book, uh, this is the system we use in the book, and I think it's very useful, particularly for this case. So, um, to summarize your uh, approach of choice, you say corridor is anterior lateral, right? The mm -hmm. craniotomy is OZ. Is it one piece or two pieces? Uh, I would do it in a two piece. Two piece. Are you including the whole zygoma and orbital rim? I would do the orbital rim. Uh, I would, um, if you can get away with out fracturing the um, zygomatic arch, I'm sorry, uh, zygomatic arch, that'd uh -huh. be great. If not, I would include that. Out fracturing the zygomatic arch, you got to teach me that one. What, what do you mean by that? Um, by uh, uh, allowing it to uh, remain in place by, uh, by push it down. Okay, um, so, so just do two cuts and just flap it down with the master, uh, exactly. mas masseter? Okay. Yeah. And you said you couldn't think of any modifiers that would expand your corridors? There, there's always modifiers. I, I don't know if any of them would be helpful in this case. Okay. Uh, to, to Mike, I think this is going to sound very Herosian. Mm -hmm. Position. How are you going to tilt the head? How, how are you going to tilt the patient? Uh, I would do, um, in this case, uh, a 30 uh, degree uh, turn with a slight extension. Okay, male eminence at the top. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, all right. Uh, the, the incision will be pretty sim simple. You've already talked about bone opening and the dura opening, so uh, uh, okay. Um, so I, I will give my two cents before Mike actually tells us what he does. I think that uh, given that the clinoid is thick, which is why I kind of guide you through to that, uh, a clinectomy is not unreasonable, and extradural done extradurally is is probably the right thing to do here. Um, you, you got a very low component, almost beyond the IAC, but at least to the IAC. Um, I think that adding on the um, an anterior putrosectomy again would be very very helpful here. Now, that then changes your positioning, which is again why I, I, I want to highlight the position, because most of the time when you do a coase or anterior, anterior putrosectomy, you're almost mm -hmm. parallel to the floor. Yeah. But you know, be, be, because you have to do the anterolateral corridor and the lateral corridor, you might have to compromise that tilting to not 30, not 45, not 90, but somewhere in between 30 and 90, somewhere like 45 or something like that. And then again, tilt back. Um, but excellent job. Uh, I think I completely agree with your identification of the goal, which is oftentimes the most single most important thing, because then everything else you do, uh, as long as you meet the goal, it doesn't matter whether you did chondectomy or, or, or all the anterior presectomy like, like I just suggested. But, you know, if you meet the goal, you meet the goal. 
it, whether you did it one way or the other. So the modifiers simply make it somewhat easier, maybe perhaps, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, you get to sit back now. Excellent job, wonderful. Uh, thank you. And I think you, you, you did a great job verbalizing what the audience is thinking. We're gonna turn the podium to the presenting surgeon now. Um, Dr. Ivan has a whole slew of titles as well. You can see them on the screen. Um, he's director of research uh, at the Brain Tumor Initiative. And um, he's the king of webinars, though, shall we just say. I mean, every week he is uh, uh, on screen and uh, he is the master uh, of this format. So, uh, Mike, I'm turning the podium to you. Uh, give us your thoughts. Thank you, Walter. Uh, I just want to thank the, uh, the North American Skull Bay Society, Walter and Michael, for inviting me on today. It's really an honor to be on here, especially with Dr. Goel. Um, and, and to talk about this, this challenging case. I'm sure I'll be learning a lot as we, as we go through the case. Um, also, one of the belated happy birthday to Walter. I know we're here today, so, so thanks. Um, so I, I agree with, with everything that you guys were, were talking about. I mean, I think it's important in this case to identify the goals, which was really uh, optic nerve decompression. I think for meningiomas, obviously, in a young guy, a, a maximal safe resection is, um, is uh, the, also the goal. Um, his, his optic nerve uh, extractor motors were really uh, almost intact. I mean, the diplopia was pretty mild and, and new. And so I think preservation of the function of, of those movements was, was also a top priority as much as possible and, and tissue diagnosis. So next. So as far as uh, your approaches, I mean, uh, anytime there is, I mean, it, it's even hard to name this kind of tumor, right? I mean, it's involving cavernous sinus, uh, optic canal, the middle temporal lobe, um, down to CP angle, petrous apex, uh, all the way into the cellar, uh, around the pituitary gland, surrounding pituitary stalk. Uh, so it's even hard to kind of put a complex name to it, but um, Anytime you have a petroclival air region tumor, I always consider one stage, two stage, what's the approaches? And I think that there are advantages to doing it in two stages um, uh, in some cases. I don't think in this case, but in some cases there are. Coming from the front um, and then uh, posteriorly separates uh, those two areas and gives you better working angles if it was really going anterior and really low in, in the CP angle. I think the other way to do the two stages is if you're going to be doing a, a large bony resection, such as a trans lab or trans otic, um, for these uh, complex uh, uh, petroclival meningiomas, um, that allows not only uh, to kind of start the tumor dissection in the morning the next day, but also allows kind of devascularization and, and some tumor necrosis and, and uh, friability to happen over that brewing stage in between stage one and stage two. And, and I have one of those cases later this week that we're doing it in two stages. But I think in this case, you know, a one stage approach is, is definitely, um, you could reach it all and will, will help uh, give you the best access. So next. As far as what approaches there are, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, literature. Uh, Walter has this great book, which you already talked about with skull based surgeries. And there's many other ideas of how you could break down approaches to cavernous sinus and CP angle and petrochrival lesions, whether it be coming from anterior trans uh, patrosal or, or posterior approaches, or whether or not you're looking at uh, the level of the clivus that you're breaking down to the upper middle or lower third, and then even extending it into the Meckles cave or the IAC, is it lateral to the IAC? It becomes very complex. And I think that's why everybody here loves this field so much so that it is a really a strategy, a chess game to kind of understand uh, what is the decision because not every tumor is the same, uh, which I thought was what was so exciting about this case. Uh, next. Um, so again, so my approach was very similar to what you said left. I, I didn't think the OZ was necessary because um, it, it didn't really go above the bas or apex. So we just did an orbital terional. I left the orbital bar on and we just unroofed the top of the orbit. We did the clinoidectomy and optic nerve unroofing. We did the anterior petrosectomy. I used the lumbar drain just to kind of allow a little bit of um, uh, brain relaxation to do all of that uh, maneuvering. Um, and this approach will allow you to get both anterior to, allow, to get the optic nerve decompression, which is really the first goal of the surgery, but then also allow entire access to the tumor. I think that you know if you're worried about getting in there and it goes below the IC a little bit and you're not gonna get to it, you know, I, it, my approach to this tumor was it's going to be a subtotal resection anyway. Um, even if the tumor was soft, it'd be very difficult to get all the way through the cavernous sinus into the cella around the pituitary stalk. Um, and so leaving a small amount, obviously you want to leave the least amount as you can. 
And, and then also you're prepared for reconstruction. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. So key considerations here are, uh, we already kind of discussed the cavernous sinus component. Um, I think if his nerves were out, uh, aggressive approach would be more indicative, um, but because his nerves were really well functioning, uh, I, I think that some caution is, is needed. But what is the plan for the eroded clinoid? It, it, you know, it's, it's so large in the CT, it almost looks aerated, but in fact, it was completely filled with tumor. If you remove that tumor from the clinoid, you're going to be in the sphenoid sinus. So what is your, what is your plan for, for correcting that uh, new um, a, you know, uh, opening you have? What if you do go through into the uh, back of the cavernous sinus and you get into the sphenoid sinus immediately? What's your plan for reconstruction there? What's the plan for the IAC? Uh, and what are the risks there? Uh, for, for our cases where the meningiomas kind of have this tail going into the IAC, I have a, 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 you know, I work with an excellent ENT surgeon for that last part of this case, and, and we have very low risks for hearing uh, or balance. And so we tend to um, trace the, the tumors into the IAC and unroof them uh, with the goal that uh, if we could remove that, we could possibly kind of preserve their hearing longer. Uh, uh, so in that case, we, we did that as well. Coming from a lateral aspect, in order to repair any kind of um, defects you may have, it wasn't expected in this case, but I think it's talking about, you have the temporal temporalis muscle with a TP component or a pericranial component, they could always flap in and repair any kind of defect that was going into the sphenoid sinus at the end. And so that allows that, whereas if you're coming more posteriorly, you don't have as many options. So next. Positioning, uh, Walter kind of discussed it really nicely. Uh, again, you want to have that most anterior posterior trajectory kind of down from the eye to the basilar apex, as well as a lateral trajectory coming subtemporally. And so positioning in the 45 will allow you to kind of move the patient's head back and forth to kind of go transylvian posteriorly as well as subtemporally, uh, which was critical in this case, uh, as you'll see in the video. Uh, so if we break down the surgical steps, uh, it's, it's two main components. One is the extra, all the extradural components, and one is the, all, all the intradural components. And so here, uh, the first, after you do your large craniotomy, um, you know, in my approach, uh, we drill down the, 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 the terion. Um, here, we, we unroof kind of the orbit. Uh, I didn't take the orbital bar in this case. Uh, we do the kind of Hakuba approach where we release the temporal dural over uh, superorbital fissure and then follow up back along V2 and uh, V1. Uh, this allows you then to do your optic nerve unroofing and then the clinoidectomy and then work posterior along the middle fossa and then eventually do your quasi. So two main steps here were the, the clinoidectomy and the quasi, which is kind of what I interpreted as, as Walter's uh, double up uh, component of this. I, I thank you for saving my butt on the double up, double down moniker. <laughs> uh, I, I had nothing. I had nothing. Uh, but, but one point to clarify. But when you say orbital terional, you didn't take the orbital rim or roof, or, or, or the orbital superior orbital rim. You 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 talk. You're saying orbital terional in that you unroof the posterior orbital roof. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's correct. Um, so and then uh, you could just kind of click through this. Obviously, just reviewing uh, the, you know the clinoidectomy. You want to make sure that you, as you do the optic nerve and roofing, you're uh, releasing the middle uh, medial component of it. You want to go then over top and then uh, release the, the anterior part of it, the lesser wing, and then eventually the optic strut. Uh, in this case, and 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 just reviewing that because here we had to make some decisions with the clinoid as we got down to it. So next, so let's just start the video. Uh, so just a couple key uh, points throughout the case that I want to talk about. Uh, one, here we are uh, kind of drilling off uh, the roof of the optic nerve. I try to flick off the last piece of bone here. But interestingly, as we get to the last part of the optic nerve and roofing in this last part, you could see that the entire clinoid complex kind of rotates. Uh, it's very subtle there. But as soon as you release the optic, uh, uh, the top of the optic uh, canal, the entire clinoid moves. And, and that tells you that there's already, the tumor's eroded to it and, and it's broken that kind of optic strut and you don't know where that break is. So that turns into more of like a complete resection of the clinoid to more of an excavation of the clinoid because you wanna be very careful. So we drilled out a large part of the clinoid and then finally removed that last piece with really careful attention to knowing where that break point was. Um, uh, as we go down now, we work uh, along the middle fossa floor uh, to do our coasi. In this case, what we ended up finding was a very, very large MMA. Uh, you'll see this is a nine sucker and the, the MMA was almost the same size of it. 
so we cauterized it and then I tied it off because I was worried, uh, you know, you don't want it to retract uh, and, and when it starts bleeding if after you cut it, it's very difficult to stop. I thought that was very helpful. We then uh, work with our drilling to do the, the Kawasi. I'm not going to go over all the details of a Kawasi at this point in time. But in this case, what we did is we ended up, I always find it difficult, especially in the beginning, to find the true and the false ridge of the Petrus apex. And in this case, there was an extra false ridge. As you can see here in the CT scan, there's a kind of hyperostosis and a spicula on top of the Petrus apex. And so that proved to be a little bit more challenging. And I think it's important to kind of pay attention to ensure that you're all the way superior to that Petrus apex um, in these tumors because uh, that allows you to really get more access and understand the full extent. And after we removed that, you can see we were able to then anteriorly move the retractor to see that anterior part of, of the bony that we need, to, the bone that we need to remove. In this case, we extended the quasi more posteriorly along the petrous ridge um, uh, because the tumor had a, a tail that went posteriorly. Uh, we ended up drilling over uh, the, the uh, super, uh, superior semicircular canal and, and then exposing the IAC as I talked about earlier. Um, to gain access to that last tail of the tumor. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so once we complete all of the extra dural steps uh, and, and all of our bony exposure, uh, the next step would then be going uh, intradural. And again, there's a lot of tumor to approach here. So my uh, uh, approach in this case was again to work from an anterior to posterior kind of uh, trajectory. Again, focusing on the optic nerve first because that was the most important uh, kind of goal of surgery. Uh, to do that, we did a large Sylvian Fisher split. The intent was to then kind of detach the temporal lobe, even though it was the dominant side, and kind of do a, a transylvian one and a half approach as far as we could go and then eventually move subtemporal. Uh, do your optic nerve decompression, middle fossil resection, and then go behind the tumor, uh, open up the tentorium, find the fourth nerve, and then cut the dura, open up the superior petrosal sinus, and work down posteriorly uh, into the posterior fossa and the IAC component. So next. So here's some of the, the video uh, introdurally. Uh, again, uh, plans never really go as you think. So we open up the sylvian fissure, and of course we find uh, a tremendous amount of bridging veins on the dominant side, uh, as well as two very large veins going to the sphenol, um, uh, sphenopalatine sinus up front. Uh, and so what do you do in that case? And in these cases, I try to hold off on taking these until I'm absolutely sure, especially because we had two working corridors here. Um, in this case, you could see here that there's um, uh, kind of this trifurcation of uh, anterior veins going from the temporal to the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is on the right and temporal lobe is on the left. When I find these, uh, obviously we had to take some of them. I try to take them above the the, where they trifurcate so that you could at least preserve the flow between these three branches and uh, re reduce the chance of venous congestion by you know, equalizing the flow in those. So we, we cut it above the, that kind of branch point and that allowed us at least to open up the fissure a little bit further uh, going down. Uh, we open up um, and then work further um, uh, down to open up the arachnoid over the optic uh, nerve here uh, and then into the intraoptic sister and immediately uh, to allow CSF um, decompression. You can see here the tumor is just underneath the optic nerve, pushing it uh, upwards uh, on the falsiform ligament, which is likely why he has that optic nerve, um, the, the deficit that he did. And so when I see that, I try to decompress uh, that component as early as possible before manipulating the tumor too much to release any kind of constriction along uh, at the optic canal. Uh, you can see here the, the third nerve, which we're getting a peak of, is completely encased with tumor. Uh, the tumor was very firm, unfortunately, and vascular. Uh, and so we're kind of just cutting right over the nerve to try to expose it. And then after that, there's third nerve. Um, here we're looking in the ocular motor triangle underneath the optic nerve, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, carotid optic triangle, and then now medial to the, to the optic nerve to really decompress 360, the nerve uh, up front early in the case. And there's a good look at the optic nerve now completely decompressed. Working loud to the carotid uh, now in this transylvian's workspace uh, below the third nerve, uh, again, uh, to try to release it as much as we can and find that tentorial edge and work posteriorly uh, as much as we can. Once I kind of maximized that approach, we then moved subtemporally here uh, and, and worked along uh, that side of the tumor. Normally, there's a good plane here with, with these tumors, and you can see here that I'm trying to make the, the, that plane even when laterally was, was very difficult. Um, and so most of the tumor needed to be removed just by cautery and, and direct cutting. Um, 
And then lastly, uh, sorry, my files got corrupted. So this is kind of a, from another case, but it, it kind of illustrates the, the last point. So lastly, as we continue to work posterior, we, we identify the tentorial edge. Uh, we see uh, the fourth nerve underneath it. And then just behind the fourth nerve is where we make that tentorial cut. Uh, and that allows us then to kind of identify the posterior aspect of the tumor uh, and then uh, kind of open up along the fourth nerve uh, on the tentorium uh, towards Meckel's cave in the back of the cavernous sinus uh, to allow us to mobilize that and, and expose that corridor as much as we can. Uh, we finish opening up the tentorium uh, then we come back extradural, open up the, the dura and, and take the sphenoid, uh, the, the superior petrosal sinus to allow uh, exposure into um, the posterior fossa. Here we're elevating the tumor off of the fifth nerve uh, in the back, uh, it, which will allow us to kind of really see behind the tumor uh, in this case. Remember the tumor is really attached in so many areas that it's, it's hard to mobilize it in too many areas. So anything you can do to find a good interface is key in these cases. And so, you know, uh, when we maximize the front coming all the way behind it to find that new plane uh, was very, very helpful and, and gives you some hope that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be able to get out more tumor than expected. Um, so here's just moving that last CP angle uh, component. And then we were able to then kind of work into the IAC component lastly. The last component is then kind of maximizing the, the back of uh, Meckel's cave and the back of the cavernous sinus as much as you can. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you really need to uh, open up uh, as the fourth nerve kind of goes into the back of the tutorium as much as you can uh, and, and really try to understand. You can get the Doppler out to identify where the carotid is in the back uh, and, and remove that last component. Uh, in, in this part, I definitely could have done a better job at, uh, as we'll see in the post-up scan. Post, uh, next slide. So key components to the, um, uh, the closure, obviously dural closure, uh, waxing all of your, your aerated uh, temporal bone. Uh, in this case, the client, we didn't see into the sphenoid, but you know, prepare to do a mucus plug, um, uh, not, uh, not mucus, a muscle plug into the, the client is what I typically like to do if it's really aerated. We use the abdominal fat as well uh, to cover all of the, uh, the temporal bone that was eroded, uh, drilled off. Next. So this just kind of summarizes uh, uh, Walter's kind of uh, idea, corridor, anterior and posterior cranion craniotomy, we talked about modification and the positioning, uh, incision, bony opening and dural opening. So postoperatively, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, obviously we didn't leave a tumor into uh, the cavernous sinus. Uh, I think it was appropriate in this case. Uh, we could have done a little bit more in the posterior aspect in the back of Meckel's cave, I think. Uh, we did open the outer wall of the cavernous sinus to decompress uh, the nerves, but we didn't try to chase that medially as well. Fat graft here was probably a little bit too big. If I would have done it over, I would have done it a little smaller. Next one. Uh, that's just the lateral, that's the sagittal. Um, here you can see a clinoid was removed. Uh, this is the back of the orbit that was removed. There's a craniotomy site, and then just a small colossi that was performed. Unfortunately, pathology in this case came back as an atypical meningioma, which kind of uh, makes sense when you go back and look at the scan. The fact that this tumor had spilled out in all different directions kind of should raise some flags of that uh, preoperatively. And so what to do after that uh, next is that the plan is going to be radiation. So postoperatively, you know, he had the lumbar drain, we weaned it after two days. He did have some mild aphasia for two days, but that resolved quite quickly. Postoperatively, he had a complete third nerve palsy, but at one week when I saw him postoperatively, he did have a uh, good movement and, and, I, and the eyelid was starting to open. So um, I'm hopeful that, that will improve. His vision had completely improved um, postoperatively on that side. Uh, and then the plan is for, for radiation to the residual tumor as well. All right. Well, Mike, that, that's a masterful uh, display of skill as well as uh, strategic thinking. Thank you for sharing that case uh, with us. Uh, Lakash, I, I, I forgot to ask you what you would have told the patient about ocular motility and uh, vision after. How would you have advised uh, the patient about uh, informed consent? 
I would have said that uh, in the informed consent that I would expect no further progression, but perhaps no reversal of symptoms, just to give myself a little bit of room. But in this case, of course, a little bit uh, more than that was achieved. Um, I just want to give, uh, if I can, uh, take, uh, take some time to give my two cents worth. Uh, first question to Mike, EMBO? No EMBO? Why no EMBO? Yeah, you know, uh... At a residency for petroclavial tumors, we did do a lot of angio, and we did find that about 10% of them, you could uh, embolize kind of the, the tentorial artery. Um, but it, recently, I found that it's A, not very helpful, uh, and B, that the, it's, it's a large delay for very minimal um, success. And so the risk of angio is also, there is some risk, 1% or 2% of, of, of risk to the angio itself. So for petroclival tumors, I haven't been doing any embolization. Um, the, uh, the, the, what, I, what you did with the uh, tentorium was interesting, and this is a very subtle point. I think early on in my career, I would have done exactly what you did, which is open the tentorium from inside out. Uh, later on now, I, I tend to do it extradurally, open, because I think that taking the SPS from outside in makes that tentorial incision cleaner and uh, in fact, gives you more room. I also would have done a full OZ, one piece OZ with the zygoma and the orbital object. It just gives me more room for the anterior clinodectomy and the colossi. That's a, those are very subtle sort of personal uh, differences that I think that, that uh, each of us have, have little quirks here and there. Uh, my, my last point, and I, I, I don't know Dr. Professor Goel enough to predict what he's gonna say. Uh, but suffice it to say that there are people out there uh, who uh, would have diff who would have completely said that we're full of BS, that this needs the radical uh, resection, that's a young person, you need to bypass that carotid, the BTO was failed, uh, and that uh, what we're uh, contemplating about just decompressing the cavernous sinus is complete bunk. Uh, I can think of, well, Sam, um, and, and others uh, as well. So uh, with that, I'm, 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 I'm very curious what Professor Goyle is going to say about this case and, and similar cases about the radical versus non-radical. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, Walter, as per your instruction, I'm going to talk on my philosophy on surgery on lesions involving cavernous sinus in general. And my talk will be essentially directed towards the residents and to the young neurosurgeons. I have been heavily involved in cavernous sinus surgery for about 35 years, which I'm going to show. And uh, there have been several publications in various journals for a long time. And some of these uh, publications are quite well cited in the literature. And also I have a book which I had published in 1996, about 20, that was 24 years ago which contains all the nuances of cavernous sinus surgery and skull-based surgery. And if you see the cover page of this book, very aggressive exposure with mobilization of the carotid artery, mobilization of the facial nerve, mobilization of the gastrin ganglion, and a very radical exposure, which was the cover page in 1996. So I'm going to talk for a few sentences about my understanding about meningiomas involving cavernous sinus. They are difficult, no question about it, but they, are, they have to be done and they have to be done safely. And this case I had done in 1993. You, you can imagine 1993 with both carotids, basilar and all these arteries encased. And I did this in 1993. The good news is this gentleman is still, this lady is still living and quite active. Although she's blind and she had come to me blind, she remains blind, but she's alive and well. And there have been several other cases in 1995. I did this case. I don't know whether he's there or not, but he did quite well after surgery. 1995, I did this. There was small residue along the Not sure today whether I would have given radiation or not, but radiation will certainly be considered today, not by me, by others. I don't like, I don't give. So this was another petroclival meningioma I had done several years. And one thing I must give a message to the residents and to everybody, 
that showing a preoperative scan and postoperative scan is not a trophy. Trophy is showing an intact patient. And there can be big problem. This patient developed hemi hemiplegia after surgery. I had done in 94 or 95. This patient was, had come to me for follow-up about seven, eight years ago, still having, he's able to walk and conduct and has no problem, but still has an hemiparetic gait. So I am wondering whether my radical resection and whether my taking of risk around the carotid artery and other things, were they good for this fellow or not? So these are not minor issues in cavernous sinus surgery. And I will invite people listening to me to go through this beautiful editorial of mine where I summarize my philosophy of dealing with cavernous sinus tumor. Dr. Lekraj said that I will plan for a subtotal resection. I must say planning has to be always for a radical complete resection. Planning has to be radical. Maybe we don't execute that. More important than radical is safe resection. More than optic nerve, of course, optic nerve is a, is a primary issue. Oculomotor nerve is also an important issue. You damage the oculomotor nerve, it is better to not have vision than to have vision. So oculomotor nerve forms, or the movements, the sixth nerve, they form the critical issue in cavernous sinus surgery. Just to give us parallel kind of situation, this is a convexity meningioma. This is attached to the convexity dura. It is not going into the superior circle sinus. This is a benign tumor according to my calculation. This is a good tumor to resect. You resect and you, you cure the person. When the tumor goes into the superior cervical sinus, inherently, inherently, this tumor is more aggressive than a convexity dura-based meningioma. If the tumor involves the superior cervical sinus, this tumor, this convexity tumor, which involves the superior cervical sinus, is inherently more nature. And when it goes and involves the skull and sub, subgallial space, there is no question. We have to have an understanding that we are dealing with an aggressive tumor. And when these tumors go to the sinuses, like this is the meningioma, when it goes to the frontal air sinus, we are dealing with an aggression, tumor which has aggression. And when it goes beyond the skull, it is more aggressive tumor. When it comes outside the skull, it is certainly meningioma, but it is more aggressive. I'm not saying about histological behavior. I'm talking of morphological and radiological behavior and our understanding and planning prior to surgery. So meningioma is one tumor which goes on both sides of the dura. If it remains on one side of the dura, that is a benign tumor. So, like superior cervical sinus, cavernous sinus is a venous lake and venous space. And when the tumor goes in the cavernous sinus, inherently it is more aggressive. That should be in our mind. When the tumor is located in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, it is like a convexity dural based meningioma. It is a good meningioma. When this tumor comes into cavernous sinus and it is lying outside the cavernous sinus, our attitude should be like we are dealing with a more aggressive tumor. And when this tumor outside in the cavernous sinus and in the sphenoid sinus, when you have these kind of three locations, our understanding is very clear that the tumor is more aggressive. Isolated or completely intra-cavernous sinus meningiomas are rare. I did this in 1995 and there was a recurrence in 2001. No matter total excision or total or not total, but recurrence. So behaviorally, there is no question that tumors which involve the cavernous sinus are more aggressive. And when the tumor goes into the sphenoid sinus like this, you can take it like a malignant tumor or a malignant meningioma. And when the tumor goes and involves the orbit, there is no question and no doubt, and every series in the world believes and agrees that these are like malignancies and you have to treat like upfront radiation right from the beginning. So this meningioma, which arises from the lateral wall, gets its circulation from here, is a good meningioma, according to me. 
this meningioma arising from the roof of the cavernous sinus is not involving the cavernous sinus. So it is like grade one convex dural based meningioma from the posterior face of the cavernous sinus. This is a very beautiful meningioma to remove. This is post-operative scan. This is another from the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. This is post-operative scan. This tumor is like a convectidural based meningioma, but it is involving, which makes the things difficult, which makes it precise and complex and challenging surgery. You'd remove the old tumor, nothing but the tumor, but you take one vessel, you damage the person. So your aim has to be radical, complete resection without any doubt. You should not, Dr. Lekharaj said, that I my plan for subtotal resection. Never plan for subtotal, always plan for total. But when you are going, if you are going beyond your personal level of comfort, where you think you can damage the person, it is the time that you stop. And this is posterior clinoid meningioma. These are rare meningiomas. This kind of anostosis, when you see, they are between, they are not very benign and not very aggressive. Now the question is, you see, this is a big meningioma here and there, and I had left some meningioma behind, and for a long time, this, now whether I should have removed, whether I should not have removed, whether this is a wrong approach is a question which is not difficult. This is not to be discussed. You have to do as much as you can safely and properly, the patient should be preserved. I am not saying the patient will always be preserved. I, please don't misunderstand me. Oculomotor nerve, six nerve are in big dangers. So you have to accept dangers, but you can give new life. This gentleman is also alive for several years now. This gentleman, this tumor was like a rock going in the cavernous sinus and he has been already operated somewhere and then came to me. I tried to remove and I have removed only very, you know, nothing in the cavernous sinus. Lot of tumor in the posterior fossa, but this gentleman is quite well for several years. At that time, you see, I was thinking of coming from the second stage to remove this, but he didn't agree at that time, and there was no need. He's completely all right. The question is, the question is, we have to do what is safe, but we have to aim for the moon. We cannot aim for lesser than moon. That is the behavior that the surgeon has to adopt whilst dealing with these kind of conflict, uh, complex tumors. Some beautiful sentences I am giving you, Walter, you please try to analyze this when, you, when I finish. Curing is a non-issue in the treatment of meningioma. Never I will say that I will remove the whole tumor and completely cure you. I will remove Simpson grade zero or Simpson grade minus zero or something like that and the cure is there for you. That is never, once a meningioma, always a meningioma. You cannot ever cure a meningioma. This another beautiful sentence is, recurrence of a meningioma is independent of extent of tumor resection. Very complex sentence, but I completely believe in this thing. It is not the treatment, but the cellular behavior that decides the outcome, ultimate uh, recurrence of the tumor and ultimate behavior. I will say what Mike did was fantastic. He has done safe resection, but he had a problem with oculomotor now. And that is not a small problem. I, you know, and he also knows he's doing beautiful operation, but that is a complication and one has to accept it. Now I want to turn your attention to my experience with cavernous sinus of last 35 years. And I want to give you some beautiful personal experiences in the journey with cavernous sinus and love with cavernous sinus. And there are several articles that are mentioned here where I have discussed about speculations about the function of cavernous sinus, its role in eye movements, its role in vision, its role in life, its role in protection of the pituitary gland, the regulation of the pituitary gland, regulation of body temperature. There are several speculations. Those who will be interested must read these papers. Now, what I'm going to show you is the power of dura. Power of mother, dura matter. Dura matter means maternal or mother. And this is from Arabic legacy, alam al-dimag, means the meninges are the mother of brain. So this is the basis of my presentation today. Dura or dura matter, mother is the ultimate. Dura, we should love to respect. Dura, because tumor respects the dura. Tumor respects the membrane. Dura is an embryological initiation of the whole life process. 
So this is the dura of the cavernous sinus, an extra dural approach to lesions involving cavernous sinus. In this article in 1997, was the first article in the literature where extra dural approach to tumors involving cavernous sinus was discussed. I am not saying, of course, Vinko Dolan's work is he's the king of cavernous sinus, my personal friend and a great hero of mine. He said about vascular lesions, approaching aneurysms. He also discussed about extrageminal neurinomas. But this paper was the first in Pub PubMed and Medline talking about extradural approach to tumors involving cavernous sinus. And this article discusses about how the relationship of carotid artery will influence the diagnosis of the tumor and influence our surgical attitude. This tumor is one of the most difficult neurosurgical problems. This is cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus. It is located right within the cavernous sinus. The beauty of this tumor is that it is completely benign. The another beauty of this tumor is it is entirely intracavernous. It will never transgress the dura. It goes near the intercavernous sinus towards the cella, never involves the pituitary gland. It goes towards the orbit, goes towards the meckel cave, but it is entirely within the cavernous sinus. Sixth nerve is encased by the tumor, which we have to identify early. Carotid artery is circled by the tumor and very heavily vascular tumor removal. This was among the first articles where pre-op and post-operative scan was shown with complete resection. So these are, in, they respect the dura. That, that is one thing, an extra dural approach. So we described extra dural approach to these lesions, 13 cases in the year 2000. This was the first time in the literature extra dural approach to these lesions were, was de described. Now I have about 38 or 39 cavernous hemangiomas, which is, which is amongst the largest experiences in the world. These tumors have to be removed extra durally. So this article was one of my very fantastic articles. Cavernous hemangiomas are difficult, dangerous, indications are precise, execution is meticulous and perfect. You can damage the sixth nerve, you can damage various things, but this is the only way you can restore the eye movements and give a smile on the patient's face. Otherwise, this patient will never improve. Going so, beyond time, my dear friend, sorry. And good you stopped me. So that, that, was, you know, that was amazing. <laughs> so so back, to the, uh, back to the case at hand, uh, Professor Goyal, what would you have done with Mike's case? Yeah, so now the issue is you, when I see the case which was there, Mike's case, the basic thing that will come right in front of my eyes is that we are dealing with an aggressive tumor. We are dealing with a tumor which is not a very benign natured tumor and which is not a simple tumor. So my first and foremost idea will be that I have to be, you see, there is no way I can say I will be just doing a partial resection or I will go for a subtotal resection. Because sometimes the tumor itself directs you, sometimes the tumor itself leads you to that situation. So I plan for a radical resection and I do a, whatever, I think Mike has done a wonderful job in this case. That's great. So <clears throat> for all the trainees out there, um, Dr. Dagubadi and, and others, uh, you can see that we, we don't always agree. Uh, and I think we're allowed to do that. Uh, we don't always agree. But I, the one thing that we do agree is that we have uh, the, the patient's best interest in mind and we, don't, we, we certainly don't want to hurt the patient. So your, your own experience is going to guide you which uh, uh, the goal you take given your experience of, of what the cranial nervous does uh, afterwards and so on. At this point, I'd like to uh, thank Thank the panelists for being here. Uh, a special thanks for Dr. Goyal for, for joining us from all the way from Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Michael Ivan, who's put in a lot of work on, on this case. I know he's been working late for several nights on this, uh, you know, with all his other duties, with the webinar and all his other work as well. Um, Lakash, thank you for, for being on the hot seat. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, you, it takes certain coverage from that. Uh, a certain uh, a plug for next week. Next week, we are all American panelists. Uh, the uh, case will be coming from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the discussion will be Danny Pervadello from uh, Ohio State. So even though it's an all American panelist, it is a uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, explosion, shall we say, with ENT involvement. So uh, with that, I uh, bid all my audience uh, uh, farewell.